Cultural engagement propels us. We have a world that now is so polarized, and we could argue in the modern West in particular, becoming more and more secularized. There are a lot of ways that people react, even Christians react to things that are going on in the world. But engagement, loving engagement is what propels us. A winsome witness, a loving presence, a, a humble posture and a listening ear is how we approach others who even disagree with us. And in so doing, we show the world that there's a better way, that we can actually extend grace to others, to meet their needs, and to tell them that Jesus loves them as he loves us. All right. Hey, and good morning. It's so great to see you here today. Again, preaching through the entire church family. So coming to the chapel, we'll be in the sanctuary here in the great hall. And uh, those of you online as well, uh, let me ask you a question as we begin today. Um, what'd you bring with you to church? Think about that for a moment. Some of y'all didn't think much about that. Just kind of threw something on this morning, came light. That's good. Um, come as you are. That's how, how it works. Uh, some of you young parents been preparing like all weekend, right? Like, am I right? Uh, there's a ratio between uh, the size of your child and the stuff you bring. The smaller the child, the more gear, the more luggage you bring with you. It is, I mean, I was, I was down in the commons earlier, walking around the campus and, oh, you know, young, young couples in particular families, it's, it's tough. And single moms or dads, wow. I mean, it it's can be challenging. Uh, I hope you brought your Bible with you, right? Um, you brought your phone probably because you go nowhere without your phone, do you? Um, but what, what did you bring today? What do you bring to church? That's what we're thinking about. A question we don't often ask is another question. Who did you bring? Who'd you bring with you? Who are you bringing on this most important journey of your life? Yes, here to church, but who are you bringing in? on this most important journey that you're walking every single day. We're gonna talk about that today. You'll see in your order of, uh, of things, or I should say the bulletin today, there's a tear out here. We have one every week. And uh, I want you to look at that. Who, who will you reach out to? Who will you bring? Who will you reach out to is the question that we're asking today. In this pivotal season, you all know that we're walking through um, a historic kind of moment in the life of our church. Uh, we are looking at the distinctives that, that guide us, unique ways that God has shaped us over the years, the kind of church we are. I've met some new folks today already um, who've been here just recently or maybe a couple of weeks, and you're learning a lot about our church. Um, we are a Christ-centered church. We say that Christ centers us, that scripture guides us, we talked about last week. Uh, we, we're going to talk today about how cultural engagement propels us outwardly, this gospel-focused mission that sends us out. We're going to talk next week about how serving defines us. You're hearing that every week and all the time. And ultimately, we're going to land on October the 22nd, the big day, when we're all gathering together, uh, and we're going to proclaim again every week that God's glory drives us, everything that we do. So we're learning this passage of scripture together, really two verses I want you to see on the screen there that we're seeking to memorize, all right? During this time, this is our central focus. Let's say it together. Would you say it with me? Uh, let's say it uh, as an act of worship to the Lord. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Uh, I think it's the NIV. Others say all that we could think or imagine. Now, we've talked a lot about the seismic shifts that have taken place in our culture. Um, so much has happened just in my lifetime, but many of us, even over the past 10, five years, things were really propelled forward, what some now call um, emotivism, okay? That emotion, deep, deep feelings that I have, in, in, inner feelings drive everything in my life now, right? And if you think about that long enough, um, if that's how it goes, subjective truth, there is no absolute truth, but it's emotion, how you feel, whatever you feel goes, my truth up against your truth, then what happens is we end up 
and we realize we have no stable identity at all, right? We have no stable identity based on how I feel in the moment or what my subjective truth is. Everything's in transition. And what we see in our culture today, if truth is subjective, then there is no truth. And this is not a, 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 you know, a, more, a recent thing. It, it's, it's been accelerated. I think over the past five years or so, you know, COVID, uh, racial division and, and divide in our nation, political you know, polarization, it has only exposed some of the underlying beliefs within the American church that do not align with the way of Jesus. And this is what we're seeing. And this is why we as a church are saying, what, what do we believe? Who are we? How has God shaped us? And I believe, friends, that we are at an inflection point right now. In, in the history of the church, in America in particular, uh, we are sitting here 84 years that we've been here. We're going to celebrate our anniversary on the uh, uh, October 22nd all together. Um, and we're going to have a wonderful time as we gather. But I believe that we are uniquely positioned in this place at this time, you know, uniquely resourced. And I'm talking about people resourced. And yes, all that we have to bring to bear on the gospel message in this day. I'm really optimistic. Some people think I'm a little crazy, but I'm seeing a generation that's rising up saying, we we're dreaming, reimagining the church as it should be. And we're all joining in to say, how will our church look in the days to come? On the 22nd, we're gonna to gather together and I'm gonna talk about what, what we'll be known for. Who will we be? Who will we reach? What will be our ministries moving forward? What might our campus look like? We're gonna imagine that together. You're not gonna to wanna to miss, you're gonna bring friends. You know, whom will we serve? How will we glorify God in the days to come? And one of my favorite passages as we talk about cultural engagement, and, and to be clear, I'm not just saying what the church does out there. I'm talking about each one of us personally, one person at a time in our lives. That's what we're talking about. I want you to think about people that you know. Who are you bringing along? Who will you, who will you ask to join you in this journey? And we're going to look at a passage of scripture in the book of Acts. You can go ahead and turn to Acts 17. In fact, this is one of my favorite passages in all of scripture. You read it on Friday, by the way. Um, and if, you, if you're not reading with us or you need to get our, our dwell reading plan, you can grab one today. It looks like this. And I'm reading along with you, all of us, Stacy and I, all of us, our staff, everybody's reading. If you're a member of our church, um, reading along with us. About 30 years ago, um, a study was done. Um, as is often the case. But 30 years ago, uh, we started to see that there were just 5% of all people in America said they had no religious affiliation at all. They, they came to be known as the nuns, N-O-N-E, no affiliation. That number has gone just in 30 years from 5 to 25% in America. And it's on the rise. A couple of years ago, I referenced a Gallup poll that showed something that had never happened since they started taking this poll many years ago where now uh, there are less than 50% Americans um, actually have any connection or church membership at all. 47%, that was two years ago. That's on the rise. And so what's happening in this pluralistic then, a, you know, a democracy, we have a pluralistic society, it's becoming more and more secular. And many Christians don't know how to respond to this. Wouldn't it be great if we had examples, and we do, current examples of how this is done. We, we see it in other parts of the world, we see it in different parts of America, and we clearly see it in the way of Jesus. Praise be to God. We have a great passage of scripture here as we see Paul's example. And what we're gonna see here in Acts 17, this is important to note, not a formula. I'm not gonna say, hey, all 2,000 of us, let's go out and you know, follow these five points, say these things, and a lot of people come to Christ. Instead, what we have here is, um, is not a formula, but principles to follow. And that's important to note. Those who are filled with the Spirit, okay, loving other people, this is how we engage our culture. What we're going to see in this passage is that we lead with compassion. Okay, first of all, uh, we actually have conversations. Imagine that in our culture today. And we, we, we end up with, with clarity of the gospel. 
Uh, and so those three things we'll see here. Paul gives us the word. And uh, as noted already today, Acts uh, 1.8 uh, was really the, the catalytic moment. Jesus says, here's what's going to happen. And what we're seeing is it's being played out now. We're watching it as we read through the book of Acts. That you're going to run into people. You're going to go to people that don't look like you, act like you, think like you, uh, dress like you, don't, don't vote like you. And you're going to love them. You're going to be a witness. And some of us even there, some Christians are like, I don't think so. You know, if I don't agree with someone, I, I don't think I can love them. And yet love is our brand. Love is what distinguishes us from the very start. So let's dive in. Verse 16 of Acts 17. Now, while Paul was waiting for them, all right, in context, Silas and Timothy, at Athens, his spirit was provoked, circle that word, provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be uh, a preacher of foreign deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Now, first notice where Paul went. Paul went to what's called the, uh, the, the agora, okay, in the Greek. A marketplace is how it's often translated, but we have nothing like this in our day. We think marketplace, the mall, we think a business park or something. This was a cultural center. Um, scholars tell us, and here in Athens, by the way, there are three cultural centers at this time of the world. Really, the cultural intellectual center of the world was Athens, still, uh, and had been for a long time. The power center of the world had moved, shifted to Rome. And then you had Alexandria. But here he goes into this cultural center. It would have been government. Um, gosh, you, you would have had gyms, a theater. Uh, it would have been media. It's, it's everything, even religion, but philosophy, the highest, best thinkers of the day, right here all together. It's almost like the internet, but in person, okay? Kind of back in the day. So he is there. He, he enters in. And, and why does he go there? Why does he go there? Well, you think, well, he's in Athens. It's what he does. He's a missionary. I'm not a missionary, I, but he's doing that. That's, that's how he rolls, right? No, he's driven by, first, I want you to see that he's driven by compassion. Compassion. Jesus has changed his life. See, the problem in our day today is not those secular people out there. By the way, secular means unspiritual, not spiritual. And that's what we're seeing. All the polls, all the, all the studies show more and more people are non-spiritual, which is a really misnomer because everyone is spiritual in some form. Everyone has gods and idols as, as we even see here. You're going to worship something. We're wired that way. But the problem is not the secular culture out there. It becomes an us against them oftentimes for, for Christians. The problem is that we have privatized our faith. That's the problem. We have compartmentalized our faith. And Paul is going into the agora. He's going into the marketplace because he knows, listen, if you think that Christianity is a, think about it deeply. If you think it's a privatized religion, like I I have my faith, love Jesus. He's helping me. I love these songs. We can sing to him because I love that he's helping me in my private life. You don't understand Christianity. Christianity changes everything about our lives. It changes how you go into the marketplace. It changes how you go to school. It changes how you enter into conversations in your, in your place of influence. It changes how you go to the football game. It changes how you're, you, you approach the football game when your team loses. It approaches everything or when they win. It impacts how you go to lunch today. We don't just leave Christ here. He's not just hanging out at church or among the Jews or believing Gentiles. He's going into the marketplace. And this is so critical to understand. Paul doesn't run from culture, nor does he rage against culture. You see, what we're seeing in our day, and I see this among a lot of Christians. Of course, we see it in the media a lot. But Christians, Christ followers, are fearful today. As we're watching this shift, this transition into a secular, more and more culture, how do we lean into this and live in this and teach our kids to live in it? Because it's only increasing. And I'm, I'm optimistic because the darker it gets, the brighter we shine. 
And, and we have examples. This is what's happening in Athens. So we know how to live in this context. But what's happening is many Christians are just fearful. We have hooked, we've been, you know, taking the bait of, of the media telling us how awful it is, or oftentimes we run into politics and they're telling us how scary it is and those people are crazy. And, and by the way, vote for me and I'll fix what you're afraid of. You know, it's, it's how that goes. You know this, right? Don't play that. Because what happens is we have one or two responses. And you know this from way back. Fight or flight. And that's what people do. We think there are two responses to fear. So we come in with guns blazing or we disengage altogether. And too many Christians are doing that. Jesus shows us the third way. And then Paul following Jesus, he then enters into the culture showing us a third way. He doesn't contend against culture and he doesn't capitulate to culture. Instead, he, he steps in confidently. So let me ask you, pause for a moment. Where has he planted you in these days? Where do you go? Where do you live your life? And is the name of Jesus spoken ever on your lips? Do people around you know that you're a believer? Do you take him with you everywhere you go better? Do you follow him into those places of influence? The challenge, friends, the way we're going to change the world our, our families, our neighborhoods, uh, our communities, and, and ultimately our nation and the world is for us to, to, to enter into the marketplace with compassion. If you don't enter in with compassion, you're not going to be effective in, in your school or among your friends. Paul was driven by compassion. How do we know this? Well, we see it in his writings. But look at this little word provoked, paroxuno in, in the Greek. This is a really interesting word. Sometimes it's translated angry. He was distressed. He was upset. That's, that's not what it means. It has that, but it's a mix of anger and exasperation driven by love. Now watch this. This same word is used in the Greek, the, uh, the Septuagint, the Old Testament. Uh, when God is, when it describes God as being upset, okay, outraged, if you will, about his people who are going after other idols, and so what it is, it's this mix of, of compassion and love of, of one who is committed to another and they've gone off. This is why it's called uh, spiritual idolatry in the Old Testament is, is called uh, spiritual adultery. This is what we're talking about here. You see, this is the complexity of love that Paul is wrestling with. True love is always filled with compassion and indignation. Always. And you know this, if you've ever been a parent if you've ever been married or loved someone, that would be all of us. If you've ever been jealous for someone, if you will, because of your love for them, this is what's going on here. There's this mix of gentleness and indignation. That's what Paul's feeling. It's a provocation of love because he's filled like Jesus with grace and truth. And this is the way we're to live. We will impact our culture if we live with grace and truth. And we all lean one way or the other. And it's why a lot of Christians, particularly those they want to put on television as representing us somehow, um, it's why they're either obnoxious, right? Or they're cowardly. Because a mix of grace and truth will help you to bring compassion. Jesus was full of grace, full of truth. And you don't find this in any other religion. We follow this cruciform life. We follow the way of Jesus. There's a collision of grace and truth, of, 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 uh, of a gentleness and thunderous justice on the cross. And we see this collision, and then the cruciform life means we do the same. Because what happens is if you go one way or the other without it, you end up with a religious life or, or a rel relativistic life. But with grace and truth, we show up with gentleness and justice, all right? So check your heart. When you see people that you disagree with, when you come across that individual that's hard to love, are you provoked by love or hatred? I've said it before, hatred, hating people you're trying to reach for the gospel is a horrible evangelism strategy. And yet many Christians tend to live that way. So Many, many of us are provoked, but it's often not love. Paul's driven by love. Notice another enlightening word. Paul saw 
that the city was full of idols. Now, you might think, well, he saw. Yeah, he saw. It's not the common word. There's a common word in Greek. It's blepo, which means to see or to look, like you see the thing. This is theoreo. You hear the word? He theorized. This is so neat in our culture. He's thinking deeply about it. He's discerning. He's analyzing. He doesn't lash out. He's thinking, what? why are they... Why are they going after all these idols? He's provoked by it. He's thinking deeply about it. Then look at this. He reasons with them in verse 17. It says, literally, he dialogued with them. He dialogued with them. And notice who's here. Oh, man, how we need this today. Civil, intelligent, thoughtful Christians who are engaging people with love. The Epicureans are there. They were atomists. Or a materialist, we call them. We call them secularist today. And then you had the Stoics who believed that it was through a life of virtue that you would have this flourishing life. So moralism. So again, irreligion, you have religion, you have secularism and religious moralism. Paul steps into that space and he says, there's, a, there's another way. There's a third way. And we do the same. That's the only thing people know. So we step into that space and we say, hey, um, there's a third way and the gospel drives us. Let's talk about it. So now we move from compassion that leads to conversation, dialogue. Look at verse 19. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. Now this was, um, this is literally Mount of Ares. Okay. The, the Roman equivalent was uh, Mars. So it's called Mars Hill as well. But it's, it's literally a platform of stone. You can still go there today. And, and they, would, they would go their intellectual philosophical debates. He brought him there and said, hey, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? So he's already, they're already intrigued. So he's winsome and he's, and he's loving, probably humble. And so they're like, hey, tell us more. Come up, come up, come up here. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, uh, what things these mean, uh, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there would spend their time, he's just explaining, in nothing except telling or hearing something new. This sounds like us, doesn't it? Our day. The latest thing. I've noted uh, C.S. Lewis called it chronological snobbery. The latest thing will be the best thing. Listen, your iPhone might need an upgrade. Likely doesn't. Your Bible does not need an upgrade. Your Bible does not need to be new and improved. This is the word of God, and this is what he is armed with in compassion and truth. Look at verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive, check this out in the ESV, that's the word see, that same word. I theoreo, okay, I'm theorizing that you are in every way, you're very religious. He sees this. He, so he starts with what they have in common. He's not dissing on them, he's not raging against them. He said, Man, You guys are really spiritual. This is cool. I'm spiritual. This is how we do it, gang. Find a point of common agreement and go from there. Verse 23. For as long or, or as I pass along and observe the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Look at this. This is brilliant. What therefore you worship as unknown, I, I'm here to proclaim to you. I know who this God is. Look at verse 24. He's drawing from his own observations of culture. Okay? This is so good. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Yo, years ago, I was in India on one of our trips there, I was dropped off out of a van, out into this little village, villages, out in the middle of nowhere, me and a translator. One of the best days of my life, okay? I was dropped out there and immediately people started gathering around. Come to find out later, they'd never seen an American, never met an American. Very few had seen a white person in their lives, um, particularly bald white person, I'm like an alien. And so they're <laughs> gathering around and I, and literally there's some boys, there's some kids and adults. I grab a ball. I take, I take uh, notes from Paul. I, I grab a ball and I'm literally saying, Hey y'all. Okay. So I live here and, and you all live here on the earth. I flew like forever um, to get here. 
And I came here for one reason, to tell you all about a God that is above all gods. And then I said, I said, I said, I've been to a Hindu temple like a couple of days before, and, and, and I'm watching them worship these idols that are man-made, literally, Hindu, um, you know, temples. And there's a man, I remember, I'll never forget, a man, a young man uh, with his kids teaching them how to speak, how to, how to pray to this, this cow built like out of plaster or something. And I was provoked, right? I'm like, no. This is, this is crazy stuff. I mean, knowing Christ and knowing the truth, I really, I'm like, no, this is nuts. I mean, I'm so sad for them. And so I'm provoked. I tell these people in this little village um, I, outside of Surya Pet, I'm out in the middle of nowhere, and I'm telling them, y'all, there, there's, I, I said, y'all are really religious. I went, I went to one of your temples. This is, I mean, y'all are really seeking after God, and that's really cool. I'm here to tell you that there's one God. And he's created everything. And I did exactly what Paul does here. And then I got down tighter and tighter and I shared the gospel and people came to Christ. They started following me all around this village. It was the craziest thing. Always praying for healing and, and for God to bless their families. And then we were planting churches after our visits there. And I say all that because this, again, the Bible more, more relevant than today's newspaper, than today's newsfeed. We just follow what, what the Lord tells us and we just lean into every conversation though and everyone will be different. This is why these are principles. Compassion leads to conversation. Look at verse 26. And he made from one man every nation and man of mankind. Okay, so Adam, he's just telling the creation story. To live on all the face of the earth, having determined a lot of uh, periods and boundaries of their dwelling place. In other words, he just set it up and he created us so that we could live here, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him or reach out. The word is palpate. It's like a medical term. You examine through, through touch that they would, that you would find him. He's saying, God is not playing hide and seek. He created us. He's not remote. He says he's nearby, he's close by, he's actually not far from each of us, for in him, now he quotes one of their writers, in him we live and move and have our being, drawing from their own culture, as even some of your poets, your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. He's saying, I'm here to tell you that you got part of it right, and there's one God who's created everything. Friends, our, our friends and and, and uh, in the marketplace, our, our, our schoolmates, classmates, they need to hear this. They need to know that there's a God who created them. And, and it's truth that guides us. But we can also draw from, I guess, culture makers to some degree, forever seeking, but never finding. And in our day, we instead, many Christians don't stay on, on task don't stay on point. Instead, we were deceived and hijacked by philosophies and ideologies of our day. And most often, many people, even Christians think, the way we're going to change the world is through political power. That's how it's going to happen. And as the church gets hijacked or co-opted by the powers of this world, we have always lost the power of the Holy Spirit. See, see truth outlasts all of our leaders outlast every political party, outlast every nation. And even there, our, our, our politicians flipping, even in the moment, right? It outlasts all of that because truth never changes. And, 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 and here's the thing, even at our church, you need to hear this. We may be political. That is to say, um, how we engage with one another in public life matters to us. And we can show the way. But we're never partisan because truth, see, rescues us from tribalism. The way of Jesus crosses all kinds of lines because it's truth and grace. And if we only think that we need to demand absolute purity, you know, to my tribe, then what happens is we will drift away from the way of Jesus and we'll start hunting out heretics. This is what's happening in our culture within our own tribe. Instead of reaching converts to the truth of Jesus, so as a family of faith, we are obsessed with the way of Jesus. And he's the one, because we belong to another kingdom. Our king reigns. We will not bow down to any worldly power or ideology. 
And what marks us in a pluralistic society is, and this is such a Baptist distinctive out of our history, religious liberty and freedom for all matters to all of us. So with that comes pluralism, expect it, okay, different beliefs. We step into that space. Let's talk about, tell me more about what you believe. This is fascinating because as I've listened, I'm a Christian. That is really interesting because here's what I believe. I've earned a right through compassion to enter into conversation. Then finally it lands with this. It lands with clarity. All right. Paul's goal is not to win an argument. It's to win souls to Jesus. We don't bring our opinions. We bring the truth of Jesus. Now look at this. Look at what he does. Verse 29. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance, God overlooked. Now watch this. Uh Uh-oh. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Like he's come now clearly because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man, Jesus whom he has appointed, and this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. He's proven who he is. He's been been raised up. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, hey, we'll hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, and they did hear from, they're like, hey, we're intrigued by this. We want to hear more about this. Others mocked him. Watch this. The resurrection, Jesus. This is why some of us are fearful. Jesus is the demarcation point. The cross and the resurrection is the stumbling block. But we know that going in. This is so freeing. Our role is simply to share in love. The Holy Spirit's role is to do the work. So what role are you playing? How are you taking the gospel with you right to where you are, right to where you're planted? I want this to challenge us. One of the people, um, a good friend of mine who does this as well as anybody I know is Dr. Tyler Cooper. And I want y'all to watch uh, this video. My name is Tyler Cooper, and my wife and I have been members at Park City's Baptist Church since 2000. Taught Sunday school and had our kids grow up in the church, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful place for us. So I run the Cooper Clinic, the Cooper Aerobics Center here in Dallas. My father started the business in 1970, and we focus on improving the quality and quantity of people's lives through preventive medicine, through wellness, health activities, and so forth. My father is literally called the father of aerobics. He actually invented that term. And it's through this organization and the research that we produced through our nonprofit that in 1989, we produced the first study that ever showed the beneficial effects of exercise. Since then, we've produced hundreds of peer-reviewed journal articles that show the promotion of physical fitness being critical to improving the quality and quantity of life. So throughout my life, my litmus test for myself is that if someone knows me or knows of me, They know I believe in Christ. That's my goal. Say I'm dealing with a patient for the first time, they've never met me. I always type, take fishers of men to a literal extent, you know, and the fact that I I throw hooks in the water, I'll, in my language, I say the way God made us, uh, or that type of language, and so they can see that there's something greater. As a doctor, easy, it's easy as well, because I can just say as part of their medical history, do you have a faith? Do you have a belief of any type? And, And just see. And then I see if the door opens, if questions evolve, then I can jump into that. If they don't, well, then I trust in God's timing that I did my part, I played my play. But I I try to do that uh, with my staff. Like I say, we're not a Christian organization, but we're led by Christians. I certainly don't hide my faith, but I have no expectations of you have to be a Christian to work here or be a member here or patient. Anybody and everybody is welcome here. Uh, But my father and I, my family, we are adamant on what we believe and we're gonna run this organization with Christian principles. Number one is that we're going to love the people who work for us and we're going to treat them to the best of our ability and we're going to love and serve the people who come here. Christ is the one who changes lives, not me. I always say, God doesn't need me. I don't think the creator of the universe who spoke everything into creation needs me to make sure that his plan plays out the way he wants it. 
But in reality, he wants me and he allows me to participate in his glorious plan. And so when I look at sharing my faith with someone, I don't see it as this start to finish quantitative type measure. I see it merely as just me being responsible to what God's asking me to do. And oh, by the way, the benefit is, is that I get to experience his joy and his love and his peace in that process. So my hope for other members of the church or anybody who's a part of Park Cities or is hearing this is that they give themselves grace when it comes to sharing their faith. There's no number they have to achieve. There's no, oh, how am I gonna work out this conversation? Live your life loving Christ. And if you do that, he's gonna use you how he sees fit. Wow, thank you, Tyler. And I love that word, um, just extend grace. So with the great challenge that you've heard today, um, I wanna challenge you with this. There's coming a day, friends. Paul lands there. He says, there's coming a day when we will all be judged based on what we've done with Jesus. And, and if God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? When you stand before him someday, because yet again, I, I did a, a graveside service yesterday and really the only thing that matters into eternity, yes, how she lived her life, but now did she know Christ? Can she stand before God and answer that question? And for you, if he were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? There's only one answer. And it's not, well, I tried to, no, I, I sought to be good. No, I did my best. No, the only answer, I'm with him. I'm falling on the grace of Jesus. I'm only here because he died for me and my sin. And here's what I want to ask you. Have you received Christ as your savior? And then what if a second question he were to ask right after that one? Who, who did you bring with you? The question we're going to close with, who, who will you bring? Who are you bringing along the journey with you? And again, to take this um, handout that you have and, and think about it. Who will you reach out to with the gospel through compassion, conversation, clarity? I want us to be the light in the world that God's called us to be. And to do it just in the way that he's created us to do so. So let's all, let's pray together. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Lord, I ask that you convict every heart here. It's your work. Do your work, spirit. Convict every heart. Friend, do you know him? Have you received his grace? If not, today is the day of salvation. And would you join me, all of us? Lord, break my heart. Break our hearts over those around us who do not know you. May we be so provoked that out of compassion, we share your love this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.